Okay, good morning, everyone. I, uh, as always, feel a tremendous debt of Akos Ataiv to Takesha <coughs> Nafshi and to uh, Rev Gedalia for inviting me. My Rebbeim taught me always that Matzel Nefesh Achas Misrael is Kilimatzel Kholay. That's what we're doing here today. I am 100% confident that what will come out of this will be matzal more than nefesh archa. So that's kol island. This is not a drosha. We're saving lives. And the information I hope to convey will help you understand that that's what we're Isaac in today. This is not a parenting drosha. This is a life-saving drosha. And that's what we're trying to do here, Kesha Nafshi. Some of the inyanim are um, delicate, shall I say. And uh, I'd like to say the following, that if, um, if anyone feels that somehow some piece that I explained could have been explained a little more delicately, then I would prefer that you tell me afterwards directly. Email me, write to me, call me, but tell me if there was a better way I could have expressed it that would have been perhaps with more adinus. I'm willing to learn. There's a Balamor in Psachim, Gimel Amadalif, the Balamor Fregd, a fascinating Shaila by Noyach, that when uh, he brought the animals into the teva, so the, the psukim tell us he brought in the behemoths tahiras usha'enim tahiras lashen naki. Even though it's more words used in the Torah, it could have said behemoths tam tameas, but use more words because it's a lashen naki. It's a more sensitive lashen. Freg the balamar, but we find throughout the Torah, parsha after parsha. Tamehu, Tamehu, Tame. It says Tame all over the place. Yes, Vasep is over here. It says She'enu Tahiris. And we see the Lashon Tame. Says Zagd, and I think there's a Gon that says almost the same thing. That Lahazirum, Ulafrishim in Achet, when it's Halacha Lamaisa, then we have to say it the way it is. When it's Sipuri Maisim, that's different. When, when we have to be clear about what we're saying, we need to say an open lashon. I will do my best when I get to those parts not to say more than necessary, but to explain it as it is. So as Gadali explained, the first part this morning, I hope to be able to explain what happened what is going on inside our kids? If we, as parents, cannot be nichnas deeply, deeply inside what happened to them, then we have no chance of helping them. And everything we're doing will be like silly pu'ulas, external pu'ulas, that will not have much benefit. We need to deeply embrace vas what happened to our children. And that will be the first part of this presentation so that we understand completely. Because when you understand what happened, says Pashat, we have a better Havana to what it is we're meant to do, to try and help them. Without that, how are we going to help them? So enough about me. It's written down there. I want to say this. This is my Mahalach. Others may do different. They have different twists and turns in how they administer this mahalach. What I'm going to present today is based on about 25 years of working with children and families in all sorts of different settings. And uh, particularly with my greatest teachers that were my children. I had a number of struggling children and worked through their sugyas, each one of them, to watch them emerge as healthy adults. And so they taught me the most. So I'm going to try and explain my perspective based on thousands and thousands of families I've worked with together with my own personal experience. And I can tell you that there is a hopeful picture here if you can embrace this 
fully and properly. So what is this for? We put on the ad very clearly, crisis chinuch. It's frequent that people tell me afterwards, Shimon, I don't posh understand, much of what you said could work in regular chinuch for regular kids. Like, I don't understand, crisis chinuch. What the, the point we're trying to make is when you look at the list, these, you know, I say just to give a concept, a feel for who we're talking about, four out of six of these criteria, most of the kids have six out of six of these criteria. Crisis hinch is the only way. There is no other way than what we refer to as crisis hinch to reach these children and bring them back. There is no other malach. Whether it's true or not that you can nosh from many of the nakudas that I will be sharing and use them in regular chinuch, I think it's posher that's true, you can. It's of course. However, over here, it's crucial and critical. And unless you follow this, you can't be matzliach with the kids. We can't bring them back. So we're looking at what I'm presenting here for the most extreme circumstances and like I said, take it, use it, apply it, bits and pieces of it as necessary in other circumstances. But here, this is the only mahalach. It doesn't work anything else. This is the only option when you're facing a situation as described in this list. There is no other option. For the mental health professionals... For any parent, I guess, it's very important that we rule out mental illness. I want to say, I say it up front, it is extremely rare. It's very easy for our Yetzirah to want to tell us they're mentally ill. Let's just, you know, go medicate them because of their craziness. It is exceedingly rare. However, crisis chinuch, this, does not work at all for mental illness. Someone is mentally ill, and I don't mean diagnosed with a disorder, because almost all the kids in their teenage and young teenage years will get a diagnosis of some sort of emotional disorder given to them usually by someone who does not understand crisis chinuch. They'll simply look at the external behaviors of our children, and they'll give them a diagnosis because it stims, it fits, so they'll get... Classically, when they're younger, they'll get the ADD diagnosis or the ODD diagnosis, oppositional defined disorder. Typically, when they're older, they'll get BPD, borderline personality disorder. They'll get bipolar because there's these manic crazy highs and depressive lows, and it looks like and emulates those disorders. In fact, it's frequent that it's almost consistent with the criteria you'll find in DSM for these disorders, and it's not. It's, it's the crisis chinuch, it's our sugya, which I will explain as we go. Nevertheless, when there's mental illness, schizophrenia, psychosis, when there's mental illness, none of this works for mental illness, and it's a foolish mahalach. So just rule out mental illness and try and find someone who actually understands this mahalach, who can differentiate for you, and tell you, no, 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 this is not this. This is mental illness, it needs a different approach. It's a waste of time doing this. It's probably destructive, actually, to do this approach with mental illness. Das Torah. So, you know, I've made a very bold statement here. And I said it up front because I figured, let me put my cards on the table so that we can understand, claw what we're talking about. We all need Das Torah with this sugya. We need a Rav who understands and is sensitive to the nuances of what this sugya is really and truly about. And Baruch Hashem, I have seen emerging more and more Rabbanim who have taken the time to assess, evaluate, and understand what this sugya is. Ledugma, I simply wrote here as an example that a Rav understands that when we go to him, and we talk about the internet. The kid, you know, you gave your teenager a smartphone with the internet. In our sugya, that's a dove that we're going to... Listen, we all, every one of us, intelligent human beings, understand 
that the internet is one very dangerous place for children and adults alike. We know this. And we know, I'll take it even further, that the impact of watching pornography, which is the worst usage, amongst the worst usages of the internet, the impact of that is devastating on young people. It takes me years in therapy to attempt to take out that damage, to remove the damage of the impact of pornography on children when they became young, become young adults. It's devastating. We don't have to go into that. Dove Parshat. Listen carefully. As every, whatever your brain tells you, however devastating we all know and feel on a scale of 1 to 100, we'll all say it's 100 in our brains, how devastating it is. Understand this. Losing a relationship with your child over a fight, your child in this sugya, we're talking about this sugya, I'm not talking about your, you know, your shefala, who's you know, in school and doing just fine. I'm saying in this sugya, with these kids, losing your relationship over a futile battle about that smartphone or tablet, which they'll get another one anyway, and ruining your relationship with your child over that battle has a more profound damage to your child than watching pornography. Please understand that. So whatever level, whatever number you give to the damage of pornography and the internet, elevate it, that fighting with them about it, a losing battle, is worse to the overall recovery of your child. The shaila we put to a rav, and, and I give this just little musagim, just to understand the musag of, of, of a rav that we can talk to, is that when we go to the rav and we say to him, you know, my kids came home from school with all sorts of paperwork, and I have to sign that we don't have any internet in the house. But I have a son or a daughter who's off the derrick struggling, and we look away and we let them do what they can do in this room. How do we sign these papers? What do we do? I, want, I, I was speaking in London to a group of Rabbanim, and they took a look at me and said, what are we meant to do? I said, well, that's your job. You're the Rabbanim. Work it out. That's what I mean by the Rav that we're looking for, who understands we're doing Puch Nefesh here. We're not in the gear to the Shaila with my kid in their room with the internet watching on their smartphone, whatever they do. That's not the Shaila. Shaila is, I've got a family. I, I, I want to continue running my home. I need help and Hadracha, how to work that through sensitively. That's what I need by Das Tayyar. Someone experienced, someone sensitive to you, someone who's not going to come and tell you, you know, immediately take a look at what's wrong with you as parents. When we first went on this journey, some 25 years ago, I forget how long it was, but the Jewish Observer, in those days, it was the only magazine that existed in the from world, they had an article on uh, by a Mechanach, who claimed, they, you know, they brought out a box, a gray box, for the highlighted points. And there they said that the overwhelming consensus of orthodox mental health professionals is that children are going off the derch due to poor parenting. That's what they said. It was the first time I emerged from the privacy of my basement office and actually became a little public because I wrote to them, Zeyashtak, with a chavar of mine, telling them that this is destructive, it's not true, and it's destructive. It's absolutely destructive, because all it does is for shem the parents. And when you're embarrassed, because now the gas, everyone believes that if you've got a struggling kid, obviously it's because you're a lousy parent. So imagine the battle that happens inside your front door when your daughter's about to walk out the house, dressed halashes to announce to the neighborhood that you're a stupid, idiotic parent who obviously doesn't love your kid, and has no clue about parenting. That battle that happens inside became the most destructive battle that destroyed children worse than ever. So I wrote to them and argued with it. And of course, this whole Pasha, they actually printed an entire edition a few months later on Children in Crisis that was sold out and it was reprinted. And, and we started this movement back then. This is not about, as I'm going to show you, 
listen, who are poor parenting. I'm not saying I advise poor parenting. You know, I'm not. I don't think that's a very good idea. But I can tell you this definitively, that it is not that. That's not it. That's not it. As a matter of fact, I've seen parents in situations that I've studied carefully who have basically done everything wrong, textbook. You know, if you read the book about what to do wrong, they did it perfect. They got it right. And they have valedictorians amongst their kids. Go figure. That's a fact, by the way. That is an actual fact. And I've studied families like that to understand the dynamics and what happened to us. We're going to explain it a little deeper. But you need a rov. We have to search for a rov. And you need that rov for so many different reasons, especially with the Shalom bias, when you get into like a terrifying moment where you have to make a decision and you haluka deus between husband and wife. And, and then that's really awful for the kids. You have to have a rov that you go to and you say, let's philosoph on the rov siriata dishmaya, and we'll go with him and let's get ourselves out. Because our shalom bias has to stay strong. Our kids need to see that dogma. They need to see us working together. So we have to meichel the ego for the sake of the relationship. Ask a rov, philosoph on the siyata dishmaya, and gave vaita. It's really, really important. Let's begin by understanding normative childhood development because by understanding how, what's meant to happen, we will very easily be able to understand what went wrong and therefore what to heal. So how's it meant to work? So as a mitzvah in the Torah, we should have children. Right? We should be, have children. The mitzvah is actually split into two different categories of understanding. One is the technical you know, having children, bringing, bringing them in the world. And the other is a mitzvah called the Sheves Yitzhara. Lo so bara aritz elogimel, the Sheves Yitzhara. Hashem built, it says in Nach, he, he created the world to fill it with people. It's a mitzvah le Sheves Yitzhara. Now, what kind of people? It's Pasha to me, and I took this to many, many, many Rabbanim and Gedolim, because the Mephoshim don't explain exactly the Gedorim, only in Naget to Geirus and other things like that, in the, in the Yachronim, but <clears throat> this Misal Yishevis Yitzara means to bring into the world a child that is healthy in body and mind, that is happy, that is capable of self-love and of loving others. That's the mitzvah of Shavu Yitzhara. What's meant to happen is that our primary focus should be on that. The first cook, when we have a baby, should be on trying, focusing on how do we bring up this child to be healthy in body and mind, happy, capable of self-love and loving others. On that, we can place mitzvahs. Torah and mitzvahs fits beautifully and seamlessly on top of that when they come to the age of Chinuch. If we really do that, zero to six, the Shevish Yitzhara is our primary focus. The uncompromising primary focus that we never stray from. Then around six, when we're pushing, when we're teaching them, Mechanachim, Torah Mitzvahs, it goes seamless. It just sits beautifully on top of a child that was brought up that way. Another way of looking at that is what I call the three stages of development, of, of childhood development. And it starts like this. Zero to two, this is what's meant to be. Halavai, we would all do this properly. Zero to two is unconditional love. Unconditional love means there's nothing your child can ever do, ever, that stops you loving them. Nothing. They can be colicky all night long, screaming and yelling, and you gently hold them. You don't do this. You take the baby. Because who knows what the baby child is picking up as you do that from your body language, from your, the feeling of fear and tension and disappointment and frustration. We're meant to hold them gently. If a child, if you, I give the marshal, if you paint your living room, finally you got it painted, and then suddenly you find your 18-month-year-old somehow got hold of a red permanent marker 
and decided to do some Picasso artwork all over your freshly painted living room wall. What you're not meant to do is run around the house screaming the vault, trying to find out who left that pen? Who? What? And everyone's screaming and yelling and crying, which terrifies the kid and teaches the child that they're bad. You're meant to laugh. You're meant to laugh and take out your camera and take pictures. They're marvelous for the Shavabrachas, trust me. They'll be mar. Keep them in a folder for the child's Shevabrachas. You're meant to, in other words, there's nothing. If you're feeding your baby, you're on the way to work, and you're ready and you're feeding Cheerios on the high chair to your kid just before you're all bedecked, ready to go, you're dressed, and you've got to run off to work, and you look away at another kid, and the kid throws the whole bowl of milk and Cheerios all over you. You're meant to laugh. You're meant to laugh. And then you go get changed patiently. It's a kid. And you know what the kid learns? The child learns unconditional love. They kind of know they did something wrong. But your reaction, what they pick up from your body language, your facial expression, your tone of voice, your reaction is they are unconditionally loved. You're actually creating incredible resilience. In fact, if we would understand this, you said more, we'd wish they'd throw those chariots on us. If you go to a chasna and you're sitting in the car with your baby on the back seat and you finally get to the chasna and you get out and discover that they've leaked through their clothing onto your gown. Now what? You're meant to laugh. We're meant to communicate zero to two to our child. There is nothing you can do wrong. There's no intent. There's no malice. There's nothing bad. And if we do that, we immunize our children. We create deep, profound resilience in our children. And this is so crucial, and I'll tell you why. Because by the time they're two, halavai, they've had many experiences in which they've tested our patience, our limits, our boundaries. They've tested us. They've created havoc. How many times? Hopefully many, many, many times. And hopefully we've reacted well to it many, many, many times. And if that happens, then when we start the second stage of parenting, which is limit setting, that's stage two. We start setting limits. We have to. Limits on where they can go outside the house, near the street, touching the stovetop, all sorts of limits on what they can do. We're always stopping them. They're moving away from us, exploring the world. And we're always guarding and stopping and directing and limiting them. If we did the unconditional love, then when we start doing the limit setting, they embrace and internalize that as an extension of the love that we gave them, zero to two. So they feel it kind of intuitively. They understand it or experience it, I guess as just an extension of that world of us caring for them, protecting them, being shamer on them. Masha Enken, if we didn't do the zero to two of unconditional love, then when we set the limits on them, they experience it as punitive, controlling, insensitive, unkind, uncaring. So what's meant to happen is this love, unconditional love, of course it goes through life, it doesn't stop at two, but when you add the limit setting, you've created a healthy person inside who can embrace having limits as we all need limits. There's always limit setting. Torah mitzvahs is limit setting. Sets limits and boundaries on our behavior. If we do the zero to two, they experience that in a healthy and normal way. And that takes us to the third stage of parenting, which is guidance. We guide them. They turn to us because of this mahalach we gave them. They turn to us naturally with trust for shiduchim, for parnosa, for school, for life. You know, choices and decisions all throughout their life they will always turn to us as parents because they understood us to be kind, loving, caring, 
giving, supportive. That was their experience of us, and they turned to us for guidance. This is how it, this is the mitzvah of Lesheva Sitzar. This is that mitzvah of creating a healthy, happy person capable of self love and loving others. This is the ideal. In addition, or alongside this, as we're doing this, we're creating something that is crucial for their entire journey through life. And that is healthy attachment. Healthy attachment, this word attachment, is a very crucial word. In the last, I don't know, five, ten years, I've been trying to talk about it as often and frequently as I can. Because attachment, the feeling of being attached to one's parents in a healthy and happy way, which you can understand with what I described, ought to occur. It ought to occur that the children should feel attached to you. That ability to attach in a healthy way informs our children about all relationships in life. Relationships with friends, relationships with Rebbeim and teachers and Morris. Ultimately, relationship with their spouse, with their own children, with in-laws, and ultimately with the Rabbi Nishalala. It teaches us how to attach and connect in a healthy, gesunter way. And healthy attachment is built on four yesodas. This is from Dan Siegel's Parenting from the Inside Out. He mentions it sort of agav. To me, it's like such a side goddle. It's so profound, I, I can't get enough of it. And he says like this. He says there are four dimensions, the four S's of attachment. These are the four dimensions we have to be consciously aware that we're doing in trying to help our kids grow up in a healthy way. They are safe, secure, seen, and soothed. Soothed. Safe. Firstly, safety. Children deserve to feel safe. They, they deserve to grow up in an environment where they feel safe about their integrity. And we'll talk more about what that safety is a little later. But they have to be safe that they won't be abused. That nothing's going to happen, that we protect them properly and care for them. They have to feel safe in the home. They're not going to get beaten and whacked unnecessarily and controlled viciously and hurt and criticized and degraded. And we will talk more in detail about that a little later. Children deserve to feel secure. Secure in the love their parents have for each other. They're so crucial to attachment. They feel, need to feel secure at the Shabbos table. They're not going to be humiliated. That we're not going to like take parasha sheets to degrade and destroy our children and make them hate the Shabbos table because they're afraid of the fahir that's about to happen and the disappointed looks if they don't know. They don't know the answers. We personally, I must tell you, my Rebbe, Matzio Shlita, so Matzio was went on a war path against Pasha sheets. He felt they were so destructive, you know, creating an environment at the table. In the end, personally in my family, when we had little kids, we settled on the youngest only. Because they love the Pasha sheets. They're like in seventh heaven. You have to and they can last for hours doing their Pasha. Right? And they come home and they know it all and they love it all and it's a simchat summa for everyone. And all we did was simply say, after each question, we asked the older children, would anyone like to add anything? So those who had something taka would add and those who didn't, didn't have to. But it wasn't this tormented matzah. Children don't need to feel secure on a Shabbos and a Yontav. They need to feel secure about camp. Are you going or are you not going? So if you have to work it out financially, do it privately. But don't tell the kids, I don't know, we don't know, I don't know what's going to be, I don't know if there's money, we'll have to see if there's money, there is money, it's not money, it's expensive. I mean, this is crazy. It, 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 it deprives children of posh security in life. Clothing in season. You know, there's summer clothing, there's winter clothing. Will they have a coat, a warm coat or not? We have to, children have to feel that they will be taken care of. And if there's any conflict with the parents about how we take care of it, do it privately. Don't expose that to the kids. They, feel, they must feel secure. Secure in their connection and faith in us as parents. They must be seen. Seen is crucial. Seen is where we communicate to each of our children that you have a uniqueness 
given to you by HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that makes you uniquely special. Actually, Chinuch, Chinuch, people think Chinuch is pounding the brains of your kid to force them to do stuff. That's actually the police's job. That's not ours. That's the job for the police and Besdin. Chinuch has nothing to do with forcing your kids to do mitzvahs. Zero. Actually, even in the Lashon of the Mechanchim, Chinuch simply means to convey in a healthy way what is the Gedarim of mitzvahs and help your children internalize the idea of what the mitzvah is so they can do it. Zehu, that's Chinuch. It's definitely not all this police force stuff and all this anger and threats and forcing. That's not Chinuch. Actually, on a deeper level, even that that I described is really what's called being a melamed. A melamed is melamed. They install information. The comments are left, oh, child doesn't know that. So we have to install the information, the ideas, into the brain of a child so they should know ideas. A good melamed, b'chachmasai, knows how to do that in a healthy geshmaka way to install information so the kids will remember it. What's a mechanach then? It's a different thing. Mechanach is really about extraction. It's about us as parents extracting by observing our children. We can extract what is their uniqueness. What is their special, unique, God-given tafkid? Who are they? And then reflect it back to them with positivity and warmth so they can know themselves and work out what they're doing in this world, what their tafkid is, what their purpose is. That's being seen. Our children need to know we see their uniqueness. We see both their milas and we see their chesoinas. We see their struggles. We see their pain, but we see them. And we have to convey that back to them so they know they've been seen and understood without judgment. They didn't ask to be who they are. No one asked to come back with an impulse disorder. They came back with their tikkun and whatever it is. It's our job to reflect it back to them. Yes, it would be very neat if they were born with a tag on their toe announcing, you know, impulse disorder, you know, personality disorder, you know, whatever it is, selfish, insensitive. It would be great. But they don't come back like that. Not with the tag, but if you watch them carefully as a parent, you feel their resistance to you. You know who they are. And it's our job to reflect that back. Sensitively, that scene, that we should see them and communicate that back to them so they can know themselves in a compassionate way so they'll know what they have to do in this world. And the last one is soothed. <clears throat> soothed means when they hurt themselves, when they get into trouble. You know, when we went to school 50, 60 years ago, you know, if the Rebbe gave you a whack, you dare not tell your father. Because he can't, you got a whack? Don't do it again. You know, you get another one. In this day and age, you go to jail. You know, you do that too much. You go to jail. It's like a world changed. Soothed means that when your child does something, even if they make a poor judgment call, and like they go out on their rollerblades without their knee pads and their elbow pads, you know, they just, you know, we've told them four million times, do not go out without those pads. And they go out without the pads, and now they're scraped, or you got to, and it's Erev you know, Shabbos, and you go to the hospital for a stitch, and it's all. First thing you do is soothe your child's pain. You want to have a conversation about how they got themselves into it, what they did to bring this on themselves, do that tomorrow. Today, soothe them. Make them feel loved, cared for, soothe their pain. Whatever happened to them, soothe their pain first. Deal with why it happened and whether there's something they could learn about themselves. That's tomorrow, not today. And when you do safe, secure, see, and soothe together, these four dimensions, we create resilience. We create resilience. And resilience is crucial because we have no control, nothing, over what happens to our kids outside the house. And most of their life, we simply do not see, we're not aware of, we're not around them when crisis strikes. And all that I've said so far, all of us 
here in this room, more or less, pachos oyeise, we do this. This is what we try to do. I may have clarified what it is we're doing, but more or less, we are all doing this. We are no different to our neighbors and friends and brothers and sisters and in-laws and everyone else who seems to be with, a, shall we say, less struggling kids than we have. We are not worse. We did the same thing. The problem is, unless you do this 100%, and 75 to 80 isn't good enough, unless you did it 100%, when trauma of any sort strikes your child, it isn't good enough. That normal parenting, parenting in the bell curve, parenting that's consistent more or less with most of our friends and neighbors, is all fine and well. A balamaisa, when trauma strikes, it isn't good enough. It doesn't hold the kids well enough. For kids, when trauma strikes, you have to do 100%. And that's the heart of this sugya. What this is all about, what I've been dashing almost 25 years, and people laughed at me and they argued with me in the early decades, laughed and fought with me and said I was wrong and wanted to blame parents for years and years and years. Now the world has, has made a full turn and we realize what trauma is because there was such little Havana of what the sugi of trauma was about. Because regular, more or less good enough parenting is not good enough when trauma strikes. For trauma, we need 100% to be able to create the highest level of resilience so that the dip, when trauma hits them, will be very shallow. But when it's more or less but not good enough, they fall off the charts. Trauma takes them into a whole different place. And that is the heart of this sugya of crisis chinuch. The sugya is about understanding trauma what trauma is, what is the trauma, and how do we understand what it's impacted, what what has it done to them, and therefore what do we need to to do to help them return (coughs) to safety. So what is trauma? (coughs) I'm going to fly through these these slides, I give you the information on the slides for your own, you know, you can take home and analyze it, read it more deeply. It's not necessary for us here to go through it all completely. But just the concept of trauma, this we have to remain with, is traditionally in the books of DSM, the Diagnostical Statistical Manual of American Psychiatric Association. So the convention about trauma is the exposure to a life-threatening or a, uh, to, to actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence, the exposure to something, an event, an experience that is so traumatic that you Pasha can't cope with it. And the Kaddish Baruch Hu created in us a system for how we react to protect ourselves when this occurs. Trauma is an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident, rape, or natural disaster. Immediately after the event, shock and denial are typical. Longer-term reactions may include unpredictable emotions, flashbacks, strained relationships, physical symptoms like headaches or nausea. Persons suffering with trauma frequently will look like one of those disorders I mentioned earlier, which they're almost always not, And I can tell you that one of the conversations I have with colleagues who call me frequently is to see if they can differentiate in a case they're working on. Is this trauma or is it not trauma? How do I understand the nuance to see? Because I look in the books and they have all the criteria for another disorder and it's clearly not to me. And I show them how to expose it and understand it for what it really is. So... There are actually five types of panic responses. I'm not going to deal with them. You know, each there are slides with the details of them in your handout. Normal stress response, you know, when you're exposed to something frightening or difficult, but it's 
not actually life-threatening, but it's close. So a person gets over that in a day or two. You know, it, it, it can shock you, but a day or two later you're fine. Acute stress disorder for the same kind of event can take you a week, two, maybe you'll need a therapist to talk it over with, or a rov. You know, you'll need some to pull, but you'll still get over that relatively easy, easily, and it doesn't have a lasting impact. Uncomplicated PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. That's what happens to people who've been through trauma. Uncomplicated in this sense means single event. A single event. A person has a car crash and someone dies in the car, God forbid. A single event like a rape, unfortunately. A single event of trauma is very, very easy relative to what we're dealing with is very easy to deal with by comparison. There are many interventions. They're extremely effective. EMDR is one. There are many other somatic approaches that you can go in quickly and efficiently with single event trauma. That's not our sugya either. I want to mention comorbid PTSD for the professionals <coughs> where it appears they have a mental health issue, and they've experienced trauma. Very complicated. Both have to be dealt with at the same time. It creates a whole complication, which is primary, which is secondary. It's like each one seems to affect the other. They're very difficult to deal with. But they're all not our sugya. Our sugya is what today is referred to as complex PTSD, complex trauma. <clears throat> In the early years, this Language, complex trauma, or complex PTSD, is so, sort of emerge or is emerging in the field to understand a whole different type of trauma. See, traditionally, we thought of it as an event. Uncomplicated PTSD is a single event. Whereas in complex trauma, you have a myriad, actually hundreds of thousands of micro-traumas which cumulatively add up together to create the same impact as that death experience or the rape. You will not find this so clearly in the diagnostic criteria. They're still struggling where to put it in. But it's clear as day to me, I've worked with this for over 20 years, what we used to call it developmental trauma, because it happened in you know, during a child's development, they experienced a multitude of little micro traumas. The most, just to give you litem musagim. <clears throat> Some years ago, I came up with the terminology learning trauma. I wrote about it in some of the magazines, and I've talked about it extensively. I discovered amongst the secular great leaders and thinkers in the world of trauma they were fascinated when I engaged them and talked to them about learning trauma. It was a chiddush to them, and they were fascinated by it. In fact, recently, I have contact with, and I hope to be able to make a game changer for our entire community. When I say again, I really mean a game changer. It'll have to be done with sensitivity. I'm really afraid of what to do when I get this information, I'll be honest, because it's going to be devastating to all of us. Because when you look at learning trauma, learning trauma is the experience of what happens to a child who goes to school forced by so-called loving parents, forced, compelled, actually often against their will, fighting and screaming, pushing them back into school, out of bed, to go back into a school experience, which for them is absolutely Gehinnom which proves to them they're stupid idiots, which teaches them daily that they're not a nachas at all, and we'd all be happier if you weren't here. Where they see in the eyes of the, and, and the voice and the tone and the expression, and they certainly see in the grades and in the comments on their report cards that you're an unworthy citizen. We wish you weren't here. You are no nachas or pride to us at all. The vast majority, the overwhelming majority of our children go to school daily and have that experience. 
And each one of those events is not near life-threatening experience. But when you put all that cumulatively for 12 years, but if they make it through at all, the damage to their self-esteem, the damage to their sense of self, of who they are, is profound. And I will tell you straight up what the kids tell me who go off and, and have experienced learning trauma because they simply weren't either smart enough or they had a learning disability, or they were distracted by sorrows and issues and struggles, and who knows what was going on in their mind, or they were molested. Whatever happened to them prevented them from being able to really do the work, scholastic academic work, at a high level. There was no way they could do it. Many of them dissociate all day in school. The girls, they tell me in high school, go to school, the, mo- the majority of girls walk into school, especially high school, daily feeling anxious. They have an- like a semi-anxiety disorder just going to school. The boys walk in depressed, ready to put their head down. Th- this is traumatic. I uh, recently found, and I haven't contacted her yet, but I found the world, one of the world experts in PTSD who does research. That's all she does. Research on PTSD. I once found brain scans, we're going to look at them later on, of learning traumatized kids, kids who had learning trauma, learning disabilities, and their brain scans showed up exactly like a rape victim. Hashem Yerachem. And then we get angry with them. You know what the kids say to me? They're off and they're struggling. And in a moment of honest candor, they say to me, why would I ever want to be part of a community and have children and put them through what I experienced? Why would I want to do that? They ask me very genuinely, why? Why would I do that to my children? And you know what? We don't have a big terror to that. They are actually traumatized by a a myriad of micro-traumas, each one which has nothing to do with a near-life-threatening experience. But if you think about it, when your atzmius, when your sense of self, where your sense of who you are is the exact opposite of what I described in normative parenting, unconditional love, right, and, and, and the, the four S's, when it's the exact opposite is what they've experienced throughout their school career. And many times because they were molested early on and no one even knew about it. And so their head was in a different place. And so of course they couldn't do well at school. And all they saw were those stupid report card comments. Painful experiences. They are fully traumatized in their brains. And then we blame them for their behavior. Like I said, I'm not sure what I'm going to do when I get this. But I will get these brain scans. I will do this research. And frankly, I'm frightened about what to do with it afterwards. Because I know it has to be exposed. But it's also, in a certain way, threatening the whole foundation of our system. The whole thing. It's terrifying. I have to tell you straight. It's terrifying to me of what to do with it. I will do something. I just don't know what yet. But we need to know it. And we, as parents, unwittingly shoved, cajoled, threatened, bribed, and forced our children back into that very environment that they felt was traumatic for them. And our kids believed somewhere deep down they deserved better than that. But we didn't know. We didn't understand. That's what we're here for, to see what we can do about it now to bring our kids back. We're looking at the sugi of complex PTSD. And that's understanding complex PTSD is, is what, you know, crisis chinuch, I'm going to say this a few times today, but I, I just want everyone just to please absorb this deeply. People criticize us and our mahalach. They criticize 
Kesha Nafshi, they criticize those of us that are teaching this. By the way, the critics are always people who have never been through this training, which is kind of fascinating when you think about it. They're always people who know exactly what we're doing wrong, but have never studied ever this Mahalach. You should always ask them, if someone comes and criticizes you or your Mahalach or what you're doing, just ask them, have you done a training yet? Have you watched the videos of the training? Have you spoken to people who do it? The answer is no. Because what they look at is, is, is as if we're a bunch of permissive people thinking that somehow by being permissive and loving, our children will grow up healthy. It's about the most idiotic thought. It, it, it's, to me, it's mind-boggling. Kemat, never do they come to me. I mean, they criticize me. But Kemat, never do they come to me and say, Shimon, can you explain to me? What does it mean? How does being permissive help? And the answer is, we're not permissive. We're totally never permissive. No such thing. What we are is applying a methodology to heal attachment disorder and to heal trauma. This is not a permissive mahalach, as if we're daft and we think that just like, you know, love, just love the kids and everything's going to be fine. That's like crazy. That doesn't heal. I mean, again, it's a good idea to love the kids. Don't get me wrong. That's a great thing. But I promise you, loving the kids alone in some permissive way is just as destructive as leaving them alone on this mahalach and not loving them. It's just as destructive. What we have here, what we're trying to offer, is a very focused intervention that's, that's sculpted and guided in a way that it heals the damage that happened to the children through complex trauma. It's a way of treating trauma. And it's very focused, it's very purposeful, it's very thoughtful. It's not a permissive mahalach. That doesn't work. It's actually very foolish. <clears throat> so what is the trauma that happened to our kids? See, we have to walk out of here knowing this. You're looking, when you're looking at these kids, you're looking at trauma victims. The fact is, the, let's look at the relational developmental, especially sexual abuse. Years ago, I did the research. Many, many years ago, I started doing research and uh, together with colleagues to gather data. We went to schools with, who, and programs that worked with kids off the dirt. We created lists and questionnaires and asked them, and I interviewed hundreds and hundreds of kids to try and get some data. I was fed up with people just giving beichsvaras as if they know this sugya. So I went to collect data. Out of the data, the first thing that emerged was that this group of off the derech kids, in that group, 80% of those children reported having experienced sexual abuse in their childhood. We know that in the overall community, the entire from community is almost the same as it is, unfortunately, in the host community, the world, the secular world around us. It's about 20%. One in five of all children will have a sexual abuse experience in their childhood in the from world. One in five. By Hasidish boys, it's much higher. By Hasidish boys, much, much higher. Probably double that. But by the overall picture in the from community, it's about one in five. In the group who are off the derech, it's 80%. That's statistically significant, which means that when you're seeing and looking at an off the derech kid, chances are you're simply looking at the reaction to sexual trauma, which makes perfect sense when you think about it. In our world, in our world, why is that traumatic? People ask me, why is it so traumatic? Get over it. You know, like, you know, so it happens. So move on. Don't do it again, you know. It's very patch. Boom. You should just tell them, so you shouldn't do it. And it was not Shein Azach. It wasn't Shein Azach. You shouldn't do that. I mean, it's just... Huh. We, in our world, 
al Torah world, I believe this is true for the yeshivish world, the Hasidish world, in our world, we create a, we try to create a bubble for our children to live within as they grow up and go through life. That bubble is called Hatznea Leches. Hatznea Leches includes everything from the clothing covering your body to the way you're noyeg in public, the way you behave with gaiva or with covert and arrogance, the way, the way you are as a person. Hatznea Leches is a musug. It includes separation of genders. It, it includes a lot of things, beautiful things, that support our life. And halavai, halavai, halavai. Our children will go through life. This is what our matara, this is our desire at the deepest level, is our children should live within that framework of hatznei aleches until they get married. When they get married, just before, we include beautifully into the world of hatznei aleches, we add in a module And the module is about intimacy. It's about being sexual. How are you meant to be sexual in a way that's modest? That's within Torah, you know, the Torah law. That fits our values and is actually a very nice extension of and included into and part of Hatznei Aleches. Hatznei Aleches simply expands when children get married, halavai, to include sexuality. That's our dream and desire of all of us in the Torah world. That's what we all want. When a child is sexually abused, early in their life, boys generally get abused as early as five years old, the first time. Girls typically are abused as early as eight. Between eight and 11, eight and 12, eight and 11 is the first time typically girls get abused. And boys, five and six, little kids, they get abused. I'm not going to give a whole drusha on sexual abuse. Now that's for another. You can see online I have drushas on this. <clears throat> but here's what happens to the kid. The kid becomes part of the world of sexual people. They, once they are sexually abused, they become aware of their own private parts. They become aware of themselves in a different dimension in a different way than they ever have before. And what they discover is that experience of being a sexual person cannot and does not fit into the Hatznei Aleches bubble that we've been teaching them till now. As a matter of fact, what they experience and are told is that not only doesn't it fit, but you're the Shagats. You're the Rasha. You're that person who lives outside Hatznei Aleches. And it is so profound and deep to these children because they can't turn it off once it's turned on. Once they discover their private parts belong to the sexual world, that is something you cannot turn off. There's no switch. You can't reverse that. So they're they're living with zero possibility of any reparative experience. See, by the Goyim, when I talk to the Goyim, the secular people who do this this work, and they tell us, they tell me their treatment modules, it has no shaykhist to us. It's impossible. Because their treatment is to work out how to re-embrace sexuality in a healthy way. Well, how are we going to do that with an 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 year old? How? Or in the literature world, till they're 23 and get married. How do we do that with half of the people who shut it down so profoundly, they bottle it up, the experience was so traumatic, it was so devastating to be taken out of that world of Hatznei Alechas, they're so dead because of it. They shut it down, and then one day they have to get married. And is it a surprise how many of those people are divorced quickly afterwards because suddenly they shut it all down and now they have to be sexually active. How do I do that? And they have to re-embrace that fact that I'm this shagets, I'm this disgusting. How many of the boys sit through high school with well-meaning, and I'm going to be straight here, I have a mahalach for it, I teach mechanchim how to talk about it, but how many of them sit there in high school, these boys, being totally destroyed as they listen to their Rebbeim speaking passionately about Shmir Sanayim, 
Vashmiyas Aguf, contrasting Kedushas Yisrael to the Goyim, to the Rashayim, in order to inspire the kids in class and elevate them to be shown of themselves carefully, not knowing that in their class of 30, they've got six kids on average who've been sexually abused, who are being destroyed at this very moment. Half of them will go off the derech because of their experience of listening again and again and again. I'm them Russia. I'm the Russia they're talking about. They hear it at home. The girls who react to sexual abuse by acting out, by dressing poorly as a way of accommodating. It's almost like trying to say, nothing bad happened to me. I'm enjoying this. This is good. And instead of us understanding what the simon is when they dress this way, we attack their lavush and give them drushes and speeches and madness and anger and crying and threats without realizing what does it mean. And of course we destroy them. The trauma is so profound. The traumatic experience for them of living with what happened to them is far worse than the event that happened in the first place. Whatever event typically happened that brought them into the world of being a sexual person, that event, ruba de ruba, it's rarely the first event is a rape, it's rarely a traumatic event, rarely at all, it's experimental, it's touching, whatever it's doing, But that event took them into the community of being sexual people. And now they know there's no place for them in our world. They're internally and externally rejected. Their their sense of self is this. If you, my parents, or you, my school, teachers, Rebbe, and principal, would know that I'm engaged now with myself sexually, my private parts, I'm engaged with that. If you would know what I do, you would all throw me out and kill me. That's the burden of pain these poor children carry. And what the research told us is 80% of the off the kids have had that experience. That's the burden. That's the pain they're struggling with. And imagine how they feel when we miss it completely and all we do is get mad and angry about their lavush. I mean, how crazy is that? How hurtful and painful it is. See, I I, I bring this out so later on you'll understand that when we do the interventions that we do, embracing them where they're at and allowing it to emerge, we can actually help them heal. As Cole's mom, we're trying to combine them and force them and threaten them and keep them in this box somehow. They cannot heal. On the contrary, we're confirming for them their evil. Do you understand? We're confirming for them they are a horrible, evil, bad person. Because our only focus is on the chetzainias. Which means to them that we cannot, will not ever accept them for who they are. And they feel suicidal because of it. The learning traumas that our kids had, as I've described, means they go to school every day, walking into Gehenim. Every day is an, imagine every day is an affirmation. Those of you who go to work, imagine going to work every day, and when you walk in, the boss sees you and say, <sighs> I mean, just what would you feel like? If the boss gave you work to do, and say, <sighs> try and get this done. I mean, can you try a little harder, please? Something wrong with you? How many of us would last? We have to go very deep and understand. You know, you mentioned it before that uh, when you introduced me, Rabbi Tava, the kids come. Kids come over to me in the street. This happens all the time. Young people, single people, come over to me. And they say, Rabbi Russell, I say, yes. And they're almost teary. And they say to me, thank you. Thank you for understanding 
how I feel. Thank you for having my back. Kids come over to me all the time because they heard something I said somewhere which tuned into what their experience really is. And they feel first in their life that someone can have compassion, understanding for them. They didn't do anything wrong. They're not bad. Something happened to them. We didn't chap it. We didn't understand it. And we traumatize them. The trauma is in the impact afterwards. That's why it becomes spiritual trauma. People say, why are they rejecting Yiddishkeit? Of course they're rejecting Yiddishkeit. Because for them, if I stay from, it means I've got to get married one day and bring up children in the same environment that traumatized me. Why would I do that? Why? How could I be so horrible to do that? And yet we, without this Havana, without this understanding, are actively trying to con- compel them, bribe them, threaten them, convince them for our own ego needs, I'll be quite honest, for our own needs, to stay in the community. You know, I once had one of my daughters, this is many, many years ago, I'd had some issue happen with one of my sons, and my wife and I were called in by a certain Asconim in Lakewood Friday afternoon, and we were told all these terrible things. He's going to be thrown out of school. And blah. They're just telling us, to Ellis, we should know, you know, he's from the game, he's going to be thrown out and destroyed, but that's, you know, we just want to tell you, I'm sure, you know. I came home. It was Erev Shabbos. I was devastated. This is some, probably 25 years ago. I was devastated. I mean, just devastated. I couldn't make Kiddush properly. I remember... I was so depressed. I was so shut down. I couldn't get the word. I was whispering Kiddush just to get the words out. My chest, my, I, it, I just shut down inside my nervous system. I didn't understand, but I'd had a traumatic experience. I couldn't get the words out. I could barely mumble my way through Kiddush and I finished the meal, benched and went to bed and had a miserable, miserable, miserable showers. Later that week, one afternoon, I was giving my eldest daughter, who was struggling at the time, I was giving her some fantastic drasha, one of those many drashas the Baruch Hashem I no longer give, about how amazing everything is and how amazing our life is. You know, one of my marvelous drashas to my daughter, convincing her of the godless and the greatness of being from, and how simcha and it's only the true happiness, true happiness is only in our world. Ah, you know, all the good drashas, right? Sheva Brachas Taira, right? You know the good stuff. Right? The Dimyonis, true happiness. And she looked, she was only 14 at the time. She looked at me when I finished and she says, Ta, with all due respect, she says, it doesn't seem to be working very well for you. And she reminded me of how I was, Shabbos. We pushed them to be there. You understand? And yet, we're pushing them into something that they find is spiritually abusive. HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves every single Jew. That's what we're taught. We don't. Isn't there something strange about that? HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves every Jew. That is Etz Mashkof HaSatayr. B'ni B'chay Yisrael. He loves us all. We do not love all of us. We actually hate sometimes each other. And we sometimes hate our kids when they're not complying. We make them feel unloved and uncared for. That's spiritual abuse. And then, of course, there's the de facto learning disabilities. These are all the kids who can't learn, not because they have a learning disability. They don't have a process. My kids had processing problems. They couldn't learn. Six of them couldn't finish high school because they just couldn't learn. I took them out of high school. You know, we went a different route because it didn't work. It was just abusive. But then there's all those kids who experience problems, sorrows, whether it's bullying or chaysapanos or shalom bayis problems with their parents, you know, moving, relocations and relocations. Who knows what they go through? That posh it, it shuts them down because of their own personal sorrows where they can't have an open mind to be able to learn in school. 
That's what I call de facto learning disabilities. They're not learning disabled. They're disabled to learn. Because they don't have a mind. You need a mind today to comprehend. So all these kids go to school feeling traumatized. School is work. It's their life, right? That's what they do most of their day. They get up in the morning rushing them to school. They go to school all day. And they come home to do homework and get to bed early so they can go to school tomorrow. Their whole life is about school. That's their life. And if school is Gehinnom, if school affirms you're a loser, then you hate school, you hate yourself, you hate God, and you hate your parents. That's complex trauma. You need to survive, and I'll teach you soon, how HaKadosh Baruch Hu equipped us to survive from trauma. What to do when trauma happens. So what is PTSD? Now understand your children better. PTSD is described, one of the descriptors in DSM, is the child will have a severe psychological reaction at exposure to internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the original trauma. So if the trauma was sexual, and the Rebbe starts giving his drushes about it, or the mother starts hacking her about this top button, you know, this one here, this like the Kodish button here, this one, right? And you go after that button with her, and she's a sexual abuse victim. Imagine what she feels like. This button? That you're hacking me about? And she has a severe psychological reaction. She freaks out. Totally. We've all experienced this. You try and get your kid to learn, and they throw the safer, and they freak out. And davening, they can't do it. Because once they've experienced, then anything that reminds them of internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the original drama, the button is an aspect. The button is to be tsanua. And here I was sexually abused. So it's a reminder of my lack of sneers, panemius, deep lack of sneers within myself. And you huck me about that button? They have a very severe reaction. They're meant to. Hashem made it that way. I will explain it all to us. We're meant to interpret that when they freak out on us, which is, you know, the Lushan, uh, you know, a maduba for a severe psychological reaction. That's a freak out. Right? When they do that, we're meant to interpret, huh, I wonder what they're reacting to. Instead of just seeking to control them, threaten them, and bribe them, which is so idiotic and cannot heal. And again, I just want, I want everyone to understand, understand this nuance. Not only can't they heal, it is vital abusive. Because when we focus on that button or that davening or that bit of learning with the kid that's triggering them so deeply, it confirms for them how we will never accept who they really are. Do you see that? We're so busy trying to make them who we want them to be. They know teeth in their kishkas. My mother and father will never accept who I really am. Which is why kids become suicidal. That's why kids die. Because they feel that sense of loss and hopelessness. Complete disconnect inside. The relational developmental traumas are obvious. There's five. Physical, emotional, psychological, sexual, and spiritual. Physical, like we all know we've come to a world where Tzvei Pech doesn't work anymore. Uh, yes, there may be a, a small group of kids. You know, I've said the 20-60-20 rule. You know, in the community, so the 20% of Mutzlochim, of the ones who do the system well, they can handle it. Is it wise to do? I don't think so. But you could get away with it. The vast majority of kids, it's abusive. As someone, a wise person once said, I wish I knew who said it, yesterday's discipline is today's abuse. We have to realize that. You have to, to do crisis chinuch, what we're talking here, you have to take the module in your brain that teaches you what regular chinuch is and turn it off. 
Stop trying to shtim the regular chinuch with what we're doing. We're doing an intervention to save lives. We're calling it crisis chinuch. It's a way of bringing up children and relating to them so they can heal from the trauma and reconnect. That's what this is. There's no shaychus to regular chinuch. You have to turn that off. Because every time you think, how could you let them do this? That line... That, it, by the way, here's the classic. If this line ever comes, like, I don't know, don't speak to anyone for 30 days and go into seclusion to try and get it out of your head. Go and like walk in the woods for a month to get this line out of your head. If you ever start a sentence with the line, when I was a child, <laughs> take 30 days off in the Catskills and just walk, you know, alone till you've got it out of your head. When I was a child. That is a destructive, abusive line. If you finish that sentence. Don't do it. Has no shaykhahs to this sugya. Has very little shaykhahs, by the way, to the, even the 20% who are doing well. But it has, is destructive in our sugya. Get rid of that line. Similarly, you can get rid of the one, how could you let them do this? How could you let them? Really? You really have the control to stop them? Uh-huh. Really? You know what effective control is? I have my clients come in. I say to them, could you please write a list of all the things you have effective control over your children or this child we're talking about? Write the list, please. And they look at me, what do you mean? I say, well, tell me all the things you can make them do or stop them doing without hurting your relationship with them. That's called effective control. Could you please write this? I give them a clipboard, a piece of paper, a pen. And they sit there like looking at me and we look at each other, and I said, do you need more time? You know. <laughs> and no one ever writes anything on the piece of paper, ever. I said, great, we've started doing crisis chinuch. Great. Let it go. Effective control means I can influence my child to do something or not do something without damaging my relationship to them. There are a few things on the list. Like, for example, I can actually get my kid to eat a fantastic meal in a restaurant. I could do that. I can get my kid to wear not sneers clothes. I can get him to do that. There are a lot of things I can do. I just got to know which ones am I doing that go on the list and which ones not. The ones that go on the list are the ones that enhance, improve, develop, and deepen your relationship with your child. Nothing else belongs on that list. Not in crisis. Get that stuff out your head. So physical, that's emotional abuse. Psychological. I went to a Chaim one time. I asked him about all these, um, you know, the, the, the Shulchan Aruch tells us, if you hit an older child, we put the father in Nidri. We kick him out. Why? Because he'll be over on Lifnei Velos Demichshol, because the kid might hit back, he'll be over the Raisa, so we kick the father out. So I asked Abraham, a Marcus Benogo is physical. What about emotional hit? What about a psychological hit? De- a devaluation of values? What about that? Sexual, spiritual? What about those hits? Nudging the kishkas out of your kid on Shabbos morning to follow in his siddha. You spend more time, you don't daven. I see many fathers, I know they don't daven at all. All they do is devote their life to tormenting their kid to make him daven. Maybe he's yodzer. I can, you can be mozi him, he can't be mozi. I don't know what the whole cheshman is there. It's abusive, I asked him. And when I, he asked me what's the difference, emotional and psychological, I explained it. And they said to me, Pasha too. We put the father in nidui. It's abusive. So we have to work through. Those are the relational, developmental. The physical, we know, Sve patches out. We know that. Brian Labour had a whole letter about it. Now, no. Not, you can only hit if it's bedas for lobach zorius. Hands up, everyone who can guarantee when I give my kid a patch, it's bedas for lobach zorius. It's thoughtful without any achzorius. How do we guarantee that? And if you can't do it, you're potter. You shouldn't do it. And school based hitting and punishing is all especially damaging. The bullying and the hitting, it just it, it destroys their kesha to Yadus. It destroys their relationship to Toya. The emotional, making children feel worthless about themselves. Constantly telling them, you know, that you're, you're a waste of time. 
Yes, so why are you trying harder? What's the matter with you? That's the biggest no-no. What's the matter with you? What's wrong with you? Imagine saying that, God forbid, to a child. We have to say everything is right with you. You may be struggling, but you're a perfect struggling human being. You're exactly what Hashem made. We have to work through the emotional, not to make them feel worthless, to make them feel cared for and loved. Psychological is like a confusion of values. We contradiction, hypocritical behavior, you know, where we dash and I've seen this and heard this so many times. You know, we'll give a, a myriadic drasha on the parasha of the table about stalker and stalker matzami mobis. Oh, we'll go on and on about stalker. On Sunday, the mishulach comes to the one after the other and you say to everyone, shh, don't talk. Shh. Okay, you can talk now. Right? What do you think that does to the kids? That we are so, we can, we can dash in about Lashon Hara, and sit there comfortably speaking it right after we gave that drosha. What does that do? It's psychological abuse. It destroys the values in our kids. They don't know where they stand. They're coming or going. Lack of parental shalom bias I put under psychological. I put it under psychological because it destroys their belief, their, their value for marriage and life. Like I said to you, they look at it it's like, how well is this, uh, this Torah working for you? Exactly. All I ever see is you're fighting and arguing. Like, how exactly is it working for you? A psychological abuse. Sexual, we talked about. The, um, with the boys, imagine, let's go a little deeper, just quickly, a couple of in the kudu, just a push up, litem sagim of the tsar and difficulty they struggle with. The boys who are molested pre-puberty by a male, a boy who's molested before puberty by an older male, typically, when he hits puberty, he does not develop the normal male disgusted reaction to male sexuality. Now, as a healthy, normal male who's not touched inappropriately will hit 13, a boy will become 13, and he develops tivus noshim, and a disgust for tivus anoshim. That's a regular, normal, Hashem made it that way. Otherwise, how are we going to function? These poor boys who are molested pre-puberty by men, older men, or older boys, do not develop this stark mania, disgust, towards male sexuality. It doesn't happen because of the experience that happened to them early. Now, Shtelzach thought what the life of that boy is like. He's in yeshiva. He's only with boys, no sheiches to girls at all. This is not like the secular world. Zero contact with Noshim. He's around boys and quickly discovers that he has taiva for certain boys because of the molestation that could have happened when he was five years old that lay dormant inside him. And then when he hit puberty, the wiring turns on. And for him, the wiring's disconnected or connected in the wrong way. And he finds he has tibers for boys. What exactly is he going to do with that other than destroy himself? What hope? What mahalach? What direction? How? And it's widespread, this kind of molestation in our community. And these boys will suffer with this the rest of their lives. Convinced they're homosexual. The worst part about sexual abuse, just understand this, because the oilam is very, very, very primitive in my experience in the fishtanan of what sexual abuse is. Just understand one yesod about, oh, two things I want to say about it. Number one, what sexual abuse does is distort normative sexual development. That means anything a person is exposed to. It could be a magazine or it could be a movie or a piece of YouTube video they shouldn't have seen. Who knows what? It could be touching. It could be just touching. They say, wait, where did you touch? If the child experiences that touching, that just touching, a sexual touch, then they're already in the community of sexual people, which means normative sexual development has been distorted. Sexual abuse is the distortion of normative sexual development. And it's a nightmare because to fix that, you have to be completely in the sugya 
open, capable of feeling accepted and loved despite the exposure of the most embarrassing possible thing inside a person, which is the awareness that I'm off sexually. I'm off. I have homosexual desire or female desire, you know, for a female or, or whatever else they have. The fact I have those feelings and desires makes me a shagutz. They know it. So how do they exactly expose that? How? The treatment is incredibly difficult. What's worse still than everything I said is the secondary trauma to abuse victims of having been abused and not believed. Kemat, all the suicides I see, leave a note. Kemat, every one of them, leave a note. And it was almost always including the sexual abuse they went through and the fact that the abuser was not taken to task. Nothing happened. Sometimes he's still a hush of a person in the community. Protected. Because someone said, nah. Not believing a trauma victim, a sexual abuse victim, not believing them. The trauma of that is frequently worse damage than the trauma of the event itself. The denial of believing them is a killer. It is literally a killer. And in the suicide notes left behind, when I'm shown these notes frequently, it's right there in the note. It's right there in the note. These things are so profoundly destructive. And there's no normative chinuch ma'alach that can treat this or help this. But this approach does. This approach is life-saving because it addresses these issues. <clears throat> Spiritual, without going into it, I just want to do the top one. Oppressive frumkite. You can read the list of rest yourself. But I have to tell you, there is no place for oppressive frumkite. Somehow we as a community have to wake up to this truth. Taira is dacher dache noyam. It's meant to be enjoyed. We're meant to have a geschmack. We have to live it in a geschmacker and enjoyable way. An imposing oppressive frumkite on our children is destructive and abusive. It shuts them away from Hashem. Chumras, chumras are meant to be used because I went through a sugya. One of two reasons I keep a chumra. It's either because my Rebbe, my parents, my Rebbe, you know, doy, 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 we kept these chumras. It's part of our culture. And, and that's my Rebbe, and that's my Mahalach. It's part of my culture. Or that I went through the sugyas in Gemara and Shulchan Aruch, and a Pasha couldn't reconcile with the, with the coolers. It just, it didn't stim, it didn't sit right. So I, I named for myself the chumra. That's two legitimate reasons to have chumras. For our children? For our children, Chumrah has to bring you closer to Rabbi Shalom. Otherwise, why are you doing it? The, the Mishnah says, Lefum Tzara Agra, right? When it's hard to do mitzvahs, Lefum Tzara Agra, you get reward because it was difficult. I once asked, does that apply to Chumras? He hesitated. I said, why are you hesitating? Does that apply to Chumras? Can I philosoph on the mission of Lefum Sara Agra if I do some Chumra that makes me miserable or my children miserable and doesn't bring me closer to Shem? Does Lefum Sara Agra apply to that? And he said, no. Stop doing it. Get a heter. Go to your Rav. Chumras, life, Taira is meant to be Dacher Dachenayim. It's meant to be enjoyable. Oppressive frumkite is not just destructive, it's traumatic to our children. You do it enough times, oppressive frumkite, and the frumkite becomes the enemy. It becomes an enemy. It triggers me in a way that I have to run away. It's no different to any other threat. It's like a wild dog that comes barking at me to bite me. That's what they feel about frumkite, with oppressive frumkite. We have to learn to let it go. 
if you do chumras, even your Torah mitzvahs, enjoy it. Have a geschmack, smile. Okay, occasionally, the film Saragra of a Torah life should be enjoyable. Okay. So the traumas, the abuse related to from kids, as I've explained, the learning disabilities, the de facto, the de facto, their child-centered, family-centered, environmental, that means there are lots of different types of things that happen to children, like taking, taking in an elderly grandparent who has Alzheimer's into your home because you will not put them in a nursing home because you want to do this chesed, but it is at the expense of your attention to your children and focus on your children is a sarichian. Chayecha kaidman would imply the children come first. These are delicate shilas, but we have to realize they can really create de facto learning disabilities by distracting our children to such a deep degree because we're not available. We're exhausted and overwhelmed caring for an elderly parent who's ill that we're not available. And that can create learning trauma in our children. I'll mention just this, that in the research I did, we looked at children from primary through 12th grade. 12 grades. And uh, one of the questions we asked the children, they checked off when they had, like, let's say their parents were divorced, right? So what grade were your parents, what grade were you when your parents got divorced? They would check off third grade. What grade were you in when you got effective, helpful treatment and support for that problem? So often they'd say never, or they'd say ninth grade or tenth grade, like never. It's just like swept under under the rug, move on. Besser nicht zu reden von dem. Besser nicht. That's why I say that the Europeans don't have wall to wall carpets, they only have rugs. You know why? Because you have to sweep something under the carpet. It doesn't work with wall to wall. You need a rug in every room. What emerged was that on average, that, listen to this, if we're talking about primary through 12th grade, those years from 5 to 18, 13 years, on average, we looked at hundreds and hundreds of children that I interviewed, there was on average a six and a half year disparity between when they experienced a problem and when they got effective treatment for it. That's like half their life. That's like a person, you know, who's 60, having no help for a severe psychological damage, trauma issue, till they're 30. They're not even going to start getting the help. Six and a half years, they carried this baggage, did the best they could to cope with it, and probably all they have experienced was criticism and blame for why they're not shtelling tzu. By the way, those two words, can we cut them out of the Jewish language? Shtel tzu, can we just, you know... Those two words alone, they put shivers of anxiety and fear down most children. Get rid of those two words, shteltsu. It makes me uncomfortable just saying them. Then there's impulse disorder. See, a lot of the kids that we work with also have an impulse disorder. Impulse disorder, oh, you know what, let me just do this very, very quickly. But impulse disorder, like ADD or ODD, the leg is impulse disorder. And an impulse disorder, are you okay with time? 12.30, yeah? Oh, I have time. Yeah, fine, good. Which number am I on? Is it 25? Yeah? Okay. So an impulse disorder, there's, there's, just so you understand forever, so you have compassion for every kid. What is an impulse disorder? So I'll teach you right now. In life, there's cognition of a threat. In the brain, there's awareness. That's called cognition. You're aware there's a threat coming your way. Your senses inform you. Smell, sight, sound. You know, you see it, you hear it. Like a mad wild dog. You're walking out of this building to your car, and a huge, big dog comes running at you barking. You will have cognition in your brain that there's a threat coming your way. 
The next thing that happens is you get a reaction. You have to react to the threat. In the space, in a normal, healthy human being, you have a space between, it's like a synapse, there's a space between cognition and reaction. And in this space, there's a hierarchy in a millisecond of possible reactions to the threat. Which one do you take? So we always take the highest one on the list that also best preserves personal dignity. So let's say we're running out here, walking out. A man or a woman is walking out to the car and a huge big wild dog comes running at you. And you see here's the options on your list. There's try and run to the car, fumble with the keys and get in the car quickly. Try and run back into the building. Jump on a car. Climb up a tree that happens to be right next to you. So these are all options, right? Well, for a lady, I'm pretty confident that climbing a tree is lower on the list than it will be for most men. Right? Because it's less dignified. It's partial. So we take the one that's highest on the list to deal with the problem that best preserves personal dignity. That is a healthy person. Cognition, reaction, with the list in between. Do we have that clearly? Now, I want to show you visually, once and for all, what is an impulse disorder. Ready? Everyone watching? That is an impulse disorder. There is no space or little space between cognition and reaction. They don't have the space. So therefore, the first one on the list is the one they take. And it's almost always true that the one that is most effective on the top of the list is worse for personal dignity. Almost always. You have to go down the list to find the one that's good for personal dignity. The top one might be, you know, if you come to school, you're a teacher, and you come to school, let's say a pregnant lady, she comes to school she, and she's late, and her, her manalis is standing there going like this. Right? So that's a threat. Would you all agree that's like a threat? And she says, yes, I threw up all of my shoes, my clothes, but I had to change. And she says, okay, but, you know, like, you know, you can't leave the class. Okay, fine, I'll do my best. Two days later, she comes even later. She couldn't even stop throwing up this time. Forget about over her shoes. She was just retching and retching. And she comes late for the school. And the analysis is saying, I thought we talked about this. She said, well, but I was sick. I was throwing up. Like, what do you want for her? I don't know. Take some medication. You have a class. Come on, do something. Some heartless zog. Now, what do you want to do? You, you feel the threat coming? You feel it? On top of the list for most people is punch her in the nose. <laughs> Slap her in the face. Kick her in the shins. Right? Next is resign. Next is put a note about her Mishpacha magazine. You know, letters to the editor. Right? You go like through a few relatively undignified, but very like, I really would love to do that. And then you get to one way down the list that says something like, Okay, I will do my best. I'm trying as hard as I can. Do you have any recommendations for any medication? I've tried everything. You tell me what to do. Like, help me out. Maybe I should not come and teach. Maybe I should do not do the first session. I don't know. Tell me. Help me. You know, you go down the list. That's a healthy person. These kids don't have that. They take the first one off the, the top, which is punch her in the nose. Give her a piece of your mind. All the work with impulse disorders open the space. But seeing as these kids, never with impulse disorders, are forever being in trouble, they end up traumatized by our system. Maybe we should call it system trauma. Because we have no tolerance, none, for people who don't, I'm going to say it last time today, shteltsu. So impulse disorder kids is a surprise that these kids end up traumatized because we're so rigid, we're so tight in our homes and our schools, and these kids don't have that space till we open it up. By the way, when you do work with impulse disorder kids, it's always gabait, always, always, always gabait on acknowledging and validating their choice first. 
That means he punched his Rebbe in the nose because his Rebbe said something to him and he got threatened with being suspended or thrown out. The first thing you say to him is, I understand the, why you punched him in the nose. I get that. He threatened you. He made you feel like an idiot and you punched him and I totally get it. You have to start by acknowledging your fishtanen, your understanding of what he did and why he did it. Only then, later on, can you maybe suggest, but you know what, you might have considered doing this instead. I'll give you another option that might be better for you. What do you think? But do that later. You'll never get to the second option, ever, if you don't completely and honestly validate his choice first. Otherwise, he's shut down. He sees you as another crazy person. When you validate his choice, it does not mean you agree with him. It simply means I acknowledge what you're doing and why you're doing it. But is it, is it surprised? All these kids with impulse disorder, as hard as we try, come up without fail, end up traumatized. And in fact, I may include that new, a new taich of system trauma. I think it's probably a good taich, system trauma. We're just being put in a system that is so tight where Shtel Tzu is like the be-all and end-all of your human Jewish existence, yeah, system trauma. They end up in trauma because they can't. The kid with an impulse disorder can't. It's not he doesn't want to. He can't. So let's do some of the science behind trauma. This is, okay, now I've convinced you that what the real sugi here is trauma. That means we're all more or less pretty decent parents. Can we all just like... Give ourselves a pat on the back for a minute. I'm, I'm very serious. We're all more or less regular parents like everybody else. The problem is some, some level of trauma which you may understand or you may not even know what it is. The fact that you don't know. I have a klal in life. This is a good klal. It worked for me over the years. Zaya, zaya good. I'll share it with you. Here's the klal. When someone's behavior, someone you know well, when their behavior makes no sense to you, all it means is you're missing information. How about that? Can we just accept that? All it means is you're missing information. That's it. We don't have to say, wow, well, well, why is he doing it? Why is he crazy? My sugar now. Why is he doing that? It just means we're missing information. And nine times out of ten, I can tell you, parents who come to me and talk the storyline of their kid, I can identify almost with probably 99% accuracy, A, it's trauma, and what the trauma is, and they'll almost always say, I don't know, it doesn't make sense. When, now, what? How could that be? We were watching them all the time, really. You shadowed your kid for 11 years. You stood next to them all times. It's not true. It's not possible. If it doesn't make sense, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means you don't know about it. But I trust, trust me, it's there. All this sugya, the entire sugya, I met one kid in my entire life and career, one who I could not, where I took him out to dinner twice. I went to Manhattan with him, I took him out to a restaurant, my expense, two times to do some research. And he said, sure, he was a very, very sweet boy, loved his parents, parents loved him. They truly loved each other. And he just told me, he never, he just never talked to him. Judaism. It just never connected for some reason. His father was a Rav. He wasn't an oppressive, angry Rav. He was a very sweet man. And I was convinced that I couldn't work out what it was. It didn't make any sense to me. I met one. I say this to contrast the tens of thousands of others that all went back to trauma. Trauma was the culprit. Trauma was the symptom. Trauma was the reason they went off. And I'm going to show you now why. Because now we're going to go into the science behind trauma so you'll understand trauma on the really the deepest level, what it does. <clears throat> what does it do to your brain, to your nervous system? Well, take a look at this. As you can see, there are three parts I'm going to highlight. And what we're going to discuss is the piece called the amygdala. The amygdala is a little tiny piece in the limbic system. And the amygdala's job is to watch out for threats, right? So you see where it is? There's the prefrontal cortex on the front. That's the piece where we do rational thinking. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Understand that. The amygdala's purpose 
is to scan the body. In a healthy person, amygdala's purpose is to protect us. In a healthy person, the amygdala scans the body four times a second. Every part, that means your sight, hearing, taste, sense, skin, pressure, you know, everything. Hearing, obviously. It scans the body four times a second, assessing, is there a threat? Is there a threat here that I need to be scared of? In a traumatized person, by the way, it does it a hundred times a second, which is why every one of us knows these kids are highly sensitive, right? Very reactive, very sensitive, because their amygdala is going a hundred times a second as opposed to four times a second in a regular person. This stuff I learned from Dr. Stephen Porges. If you want to learn more about it, you can find all sorts of amazing. He's a genius of a genius. Grada Ayid Nebuch. After I finished talking to him the first time, I asked him, you're Jewish, right? He says, how do you know? I said, I bet your parents are Holocaust survivors. He says, yeah, how do you know? It's like, it's posh it. What happened? And he's like the world famous person in all the research in trauma. He's like the top of the pile of doing science, research in science that taught us all this stuff. He's an remarkable, sweet man, a very, very special person. Very, I mean, just a very kind, kind human being. A pleasure to talk to him, but he is, he went off, unfortunately. He grew up with survivor parents and uh, went off. The amygdala's purpose is to protect us. So it scans the body constantly for threats. It's something like this. Here's what happens. You're on a Cholomoid trip during uh, Yantav, during Pesach. You're in a park somewhere. You're sitting on your, you know, your um, rug or whatever it is you bring with. And you're having a snap picnic. And out of the woods, about 100 feet away, walks from the undergrowth a medium-sized bear. Well, here's what you're not meant to do. You're not meant to say, oh, look, look, look at the cute bear. Everyone, now one second, which ones are the ones that kill us? The brown ones or the black ones? I know one of them we're not scared. Can someone look it up? Isn't that good? I don't know if it's brown or black, actually. I'm not sure which one. And then someone says, come, let's take a selfie. Come, let's get in the picture with them. You're not meant to do any of this stuff. HaKadosh Baruch Hu made us in a way where we have this beautiful thing called the amygdala. And the amygdala senses a threat and shuts down the prefrontal cortex or tones it down, shuts it down. It's not, Dr. Porges and I had actually had an argument about it and he agreed with me in the end. It's a dial, it's not a switch. It, doesn't, it can switch off. But it's more like a dial. It dials down your access to the prefrontal cortex. And in extreme case of threat, it switches it off completely. So you don't have that. Why? Because you don't want to do those stupid things like selfies or like clearing which type and doing an analysis of the type of bear and assessment how fast can they run and we run. And do you think there's a mother bear walking behind it? You know, is it a lot? You're not meant to do any of that. You're meant to say to everyone, okay. The car, slowly, everyone, now, leave everything. And you just leave everything and get in the car. The amygdala does that for us. It shuts down the rational thinking part of the brain in order to help us survive. That is a wonderful thing. Not to have an amygdala functioning properly. You're in a life-threatening situation at some point in your life. The amygdala keeps us alive. That's its job. What it does is convert a previous threat to a future threat. In other words, it assesses your life experience, drawing from past knowledge and experience to project, pre predict the future and therefore keep you safe. It has the ability to shut down the function of the prefrontal cortex. This is the key to understanding our children and it is the foundation on which crisis chinuch is built. The principle behind why we went this route and why I developed this whole system is this. Right now, you're going to see it. Take a look at this. The dark green part is the executive states. That's the prefrontal cortex, the, the, the prefrontal lobes. The emotional system is in the middle. The survival is the red. That's the brainstem. Where the amygdala sees danger, 
It shuts down first the executive states, and then it can shut down the emotional states too and take you right into the survival part where you will survive. It's life or death. It makes sure you survive. You go offline completely. Take a look at this. This is it. This picture is going to help us with everything. Look at the nine functions of the prefrontal cortex, bearing in mind that when you feel threatened, the amygdala impairs or shuts down these nine functions. Empathy. Empathy. You wonder why your kids are not empathic. Insight. Don't they hop what they're doing? is going to get them into trouble. Response flexibility. Why do you have to react that way and throw things and scream things and curse? You know, be thoughtful about how you respond. Emotion regulation. Control your emotions. Body regulation. Morality. Intuition. Attuned communication. Right? Connect with what I'm saying. And fear modulation. To understand what's frightening or not. These are the nine primary functions of the prefrontal cortex. And when a child or person gets triggered into a PTSD mode, this shuts down. Why? Because you don't want to use any of those qualities when a bear is coming out of the woodworks. When you're threatened, Hashem made it that that stuff shuts off so you will survive. You will live. You'll get out of there. You won't be doing stupid things like taking selfies with a bear. But you'll be gone. Imagine our kids are completely... Think about your, one of your kids. The, when they're triggered, are they not completely irrational? Are they not completely irrational when they're threatened? There's no one, how many times do we think there's no one to talk to? There's no one home. They're acting crazy. Think of all those lines and now reframe those lines in reference to this. They cannot act rational or thoughtful when they're triggered. HaKadosh Baruch Hu made them in a way they will be safe. They will go offline. And just think about personal survival. If I'm in a classroom as a sexual abuse victim that I've never told anyone about and the boy is sexually active with himself and his rabbi is telling us that anyone who, who touches themselves or, or is interested or looking even at the, the, uh, uh, is a guy gomer. So that 12-year-old, 13-year-old boy has to shut down his head. He has to dissociate. How will he deal with being a guy gama? How will he go home and look at his parents knowing he's a guy gama? It's a shagetz. And he's too for Shem to even talk about it because he knows how everyone's going to look at him. So this part shuts off and he goes into fight and flight or freeze to disappear and to be safe. Take a look at this. It's posh heartbreaking. The picture on the left is a healthy brain. The red, heavy red parts is the prefrontal cortex. That piece that I showed you before, this, the prefrontal cortex, see the red part on the top? Well, that's the red parts on the bottom, the left and right lobes. They're lit up in a healthy brain, functioning and healthy. Look at the one on the right, the PTSD brain. As you can see, the electrical activity is all over the place. It's fascinating, actually, because in the language, you know, we're always saying kids like this, or trauma victims, are all over the place. Well, they are actually technically, in their brain, all over the place. They don't have the electrical activity is not in the prefrontal cortex where it's meant to be, which means they cannot possibly have a rational conversation with you. I don't care how kind and polite you think you are till you bring them back online, which is the first step of the crazy interventions we do in crisis chinuch, the nutty permissive and crazy things we allow has nothing to do with permissiveness. It's about bringing them back online. I hope you understand that. People think it's like some sort of chinuch thing, that we should allow them to dress this way. That's crazy thinking. It has no shaykhs to the sugya. 
The sugya is if my kid is offline because they're in a mode of fight, flight, or freeze, well, how exactly am I going to engage them and help them with their life? I have to bring them back online first. And the interventions we use are not permissive, weak, scared, because we're scared of them interventions. They're direct interventions that reach inside their sense of self and make them feel safe and thereby bring them back online. Look at the brain. I mean, it's crazy. Look at this one. Here's another one. The top is a healthy brain. See where the red is all nice and red on the top? In this, the abused brain, this is the brain of an abused child. Take a look. It's all in the back. The heaviest area is the red. That's the survival that's the survival part of the brain that we showed you before. That's the red part. All the electricity is basically back there with limited at the front. Crisis chinuch is about shifting them back to their prefrontal cortex. And, and do you understand this is so important because I'm telling you in the Veltarine, people talk as if, you know, when they hear the things we do, as if we're some sort of permissive ma'alach that should magically help kids. This is intervention. It's a direct intervention to bring them back online so we have someone to talk to and someone to help. Otherwise, you can't help them. So imagine, just imagine how cruel it is for a kid who's in a trauma, being traumatized, in a trauma mode, being triggered, and we're going to tell them, just get over it. Number one, they don't even hear you say it, by the way. They're completely dissociated. They can actually schmeck your face. Your, and Paul just said something very amazing. One of the great chidushim he had, in my humble opinion, he's, had the, he's, he's really informed the mental health world. Probably the greatest impact of anyone in modern times. Probably since Freud himself, in my opinion, is Stephen Borges. He's probably had the greatest impact on our field overall. Things that we've been saying, myself and colleagues, for 20 years, he gave us the science to prove it, which is so extraordinary. So one of the words he developed, he invented, was a word called neuroception. Neuroception, so fantastic. He invented the word. It's a great word. Neuroception means like this. My nervous system, this, by the way, Chazal talked about this long before Stephen Borges. Kemayim ponim ken leva adam, right? We, we know... The neuroception means when you, you know, we all experience it. I'll tell you when you know neuroception is happening. It's when you, your wife asked you, please be home on time for supper at seven. You said, sure, no problem, be home. And you, you kind of mosey in at eight, ten without having called. Generally speaking, your neuroception as you walk in the door will pick up how mad she is at you. Which when you see her, you'll say, why are you upset? And then she'll kill you. Right? That's neuroception. Neuroception means your nervous system picks up in the background. It's all in the background. With the amygdala, it picks up danger and threat. You experience someone else's neurological system. You, it, actually, the orbital muscles are the most common. When you look here, that's why looks can kill. Right? Right? The, 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 you should face the way you, sar, sar iron. Closing down your eyes, sar iron. Right? Look, the, these muscles especially, we see them in each other and they tell us a world about who the person is you're talking to, what they're feeling, what's going on. So imagine how cruel it is with our kids when we say idiotic things like just get over it. Can't you just get over it? I mean, Shafla, come on. You're ruining your life. Don't you realize when you dress like that, what you do to yourself? By the way, when I say even these words here, I have my, my nervous system cringes. I, I know the pain of the kids who've experienced these lines. They want to kill you. It's a miracle they don't. Then we wonder why they look psychotic. Do you've seen that look with your kids? Right? When you say these lines and you think you're being nice, I said it so nicely. I said, Shafala, come on, just like dress from. So good for you. Shafala. Namala. Right? And they want to kill you. They look psychotic. You want to call the doctor. Get Katsale right now. 
they look they look like they're going to kill someone at that moment. That's this. That's what's happening to them. They, they've got, they're so offline. They're so in safety. They just want to be safe and not having a traumatic reaction, which is really what we're doing to them. We have to understand their brain, the amygdala, hijacks the brain. Think of it that way. When the amygdala, their amygdala senses fear, stress, fright, exposure to their shame, for example, exposure to being not good enough, not davening well enough, not learning well enough, that you're chase, you're bad, then the amygdala takes over the brain. You don't have anyone to talk to. Crisis, chinus, chinuch is a vegestelt on this you saw it, that we, if we can't bring them back online, how can we help them? How? They're just going to keep running and running and running until, God forbid, they find they can't run anymore and they no longer want to live. That's really what happens. Where they need so much drugs because their pain is so intense and then unfortunately they pass from doing so much drugs. And all they were doing was trying to get away from that pain that we keep on inflicting by asking them to get over it. Parts of the brain are hyperactive hyper, and parts hypoactive. That's why you often find kids like this falsely diagnosed with bipolar disorder. You know, they have manic, manic moments and depressive moments. But that's what happens in trauma. There are different times where different parts of the brain are more active and less active because the amygdala is in charge and it, it's really trying to assess their relative safety right now. Now, here's a very crucial thing. We view, that means when we, the world of psychology, we understand that their reaction when the amygdala triggers them to get them safe is adaptive. Adaptive is a way of surviving. So, for example, a very simple example would be um, a girl that's been sexually abused will sometimes, some of them... Uh, I don't want to give numbers, but a significant number of them will act out sexually. The little girls, and they will act out, they will dress in a provocative fashion, look for a boy, or maybe even a girl, and they will act out sexually. We look at that as adaptive. What they're doing is, to a certain degree, trying to deny the depths of their agony and pain and that anything bad happened to me, by saying, this is my choice. I'm enjoying this. This is my fun. That's adaptive. It's a way of trying to deny the deep hurt and pain. It's the same way that kids will go and do drugs. They'll, take, they'll smoke marijuana. Why will they smoke marijuana? Because when they smoke marijuana, pot, five minutes, okay, I'm getting there. Oh, mamish, we're good on time. When, when, they, when they smoke pot and stuff, that's adaptive. It's not because they're idiots who think the drugs is a smart move. It's because they're in so much incredible pain, they might die. So rather than live with the amount of pain that could actually kill them, because they can't live with that much pain, they smoke marijuana so they chill. I'm chilled, Mom, I'm chilled. Let's chill. They always want to chill. Everything's chilled. You know, we all hate that word. Don't say that word, chill. Please, let's all chill together. Come on, uh, let me get in my pajamas and we'll all chill. You know, for them, chilling is an alternative to dying. It's adaptive. Do you understand? They're adaptive. See, what becomes maladaptive is if you do the adaptive thing for the rest of your life. So in treatment, when I talk to kids at the right moment or young adults when they're beginning to understand what happened to them, I'll make the observation that I wonder when that behavior will be maladaptive for you. And they say, what does that mean? Because I've already made the case of fully supporting it's adaptive. You've adapted to survive. You did exactly what God programmed you to do. And you survived. You did exactly what you're meant to do. And I just, the, the right time and the right moment could be six months into the work. I'll just like float out there. I wonder when that same thing might be maladaptive. I'll hear something from them that they're beginning to see it. 
And they say, what do you mean? I say, well, look, the same marijuana that helped you survive is sort of interfering with your ability to go to work, isn't it? And they'll say, yes. So then it's maladaptive. So now we start the process of understanding when is it adaptive, when is it maladaptive. But if you don't acknowledge it's adaptive, if you don't see that, that it was life, it, it gave them life, they survived, it was truly v'chai bayam. If you don't acknowledge that and affirm that, you can never get to the other place. Do you see that? So therefore, when triggered, is it reasonable to reason with them? If this part of your brain is offline, the part with which you reason, the prefrontal cortex, and a kid is offline because they got triggered, and we try to reason with them, is that reasonable? No. Who's unreasonable now? We are. To reason with someone who is un-reasonable because they're offline, that is not reasonable. That's crazy. And abusive. So when they're offline, we don't reason with them. We validate them. We tune into them. We understand they need that part. They need those drugs. They need that lack of sneer sticker clothing. They need their girlfriend. They need their boyfriend. They need what they need because that's adaptive. And thank God they have it because you're going to survive with it. It helps you survive. We have to go deeply into that place, understand that place, embrace that place, support that place. So when they ask us for some unsneer sticker piece of clothing, you know, and they delicately, and you know they, they, we're dealing with this sugya, you say, of course, Shefala, how many do you need? They say, what do you mean? They say, well, you asked me for one. Maybe you need three. Maybe you'd like different colors. And what you're doing, do you understand, is bringing them back online. You're taking the threat and the fear away from them. When we reach in through crisis chinuch, we actually bring them back online, which means that we have a chance to start helping them get their lives back. This is really the heart and soul of it. And you have to realize, despite the damage of trauma, there is a thing called neuroplasticity. It means brains can be repaired. With time, with this, we have watched it, witnessed it, and seen it, that the kids get their lives back. And they, you know, I want to be very clear about this. When I say this, do not misunderstand me, please. I use the return to Shmir Shabbos mitzvahs as an index, as an understanding of their healing. It is not the matara. If your matara with your kid in crisis chinuch is to get them back to being from, you already failed. You already failed. Abandon the notion of making them from. Obviously, it goes without saying, we and even they understand that we would love them to be from. Again, right? Let's push it. Abandon that notion because it will get in the way. Totally get in the way. I want my child to live. I want my child to be healthy and to live. I use Shmir Shabbos as an index, just as a, a guide to understand that when they get retrained, the brain is retrained, and we reach in, the vast majority will return naturally to Shmir Shabbos without you ever saying anything. It will come from them, not from us. Because we've reached inside and we've helped them heal their trauma and be able to live an online life. And when they're online... That's when miracles can happen. When they're offline, danger, threat, and potential death can happen. Our job is to reach inside and understand we're dealing with trauma. Our goal is to bring them online. And the question is how?